a lot of you and I, are probably with me that you feel not enough. Uh, you feel like, well, I don't. Maybe there's some. Maybe there's times you think this. You know, I really don't pray enough. I don't pray like I should. Uh, I don't. I don't study my Bible like I should. I don't uh, give my time like I should. I don't devote myself um, to visiting people like I should. And listen, anytime uh, I've had any encounter with good deacons and good elders, they all feel exactly that. I don't feel like I'm doing enough. Because everyone feels that way. You know, the worst human beings are the ones who are like, I'm doing pretty good. But everyone genuinely, deep down, feels, I'm not enough. And when you apply that to Christianity, sometimes that can kind of take hits at our ability to feel in actual relationship with God. So whenever I feel like I, I'm just not doing enough, I'm not, I'm not praying enough, I'm not studying my Bible like I should, when you feel like that, I want you to know you're not alone. But I also want you to know that you need to change your whole perception of how this thing works. Because it's not about achieving enough. It's not about doing enough. The Christian faith has more to do with where you are than with what you're doing and how, how well you're doing it. There's this part in Philippians, um, Philippians chapter 4, that's where we'll be today. Philippians chapter 4. And I, I don't have my slides here, so it'll be, um, we'll just hope, can you move through them for me? There's just five slides. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, he says, Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm. In the Lord, dear friends. He's coming off this example of himself saying, I've, I've, I've pressed on toward the goal. I've, I've done what I've hoped to do. And you should stand firm. There's this image of standing by putting your feet down, staying in place in the Lord. People act different depending on where they are. So people act differently at church or at, at, at worship when they're with their church than they do when they are at the gym or than they do when they're at work or they do whenever they're um, eating out. We change our behaviors based on where we are. When I worked at McDonald's this week, uh, July 4th was the worst time to work at McDonald's because you had people passing through. And when there's no standard on how you should act based on this present place, like so, if I go if I go to this McDonald's here and act a fool, as the kids say, then, then I will. The date it'll, news will get back to Dana Schwab that I was acting a mess, and it'll get to David, and David will tell Jenny, and Jenny will tell Rachel, and Rachel will tell me, and I'll say goodbye. But I can be held accountable in certain places. And whenever people travel and they, they, they would come into McDonald's and you could tell the ones who were traveling because they were jerks. <laughs> they didn't care. They would just, they would, they, they would treat you however they felt you needed to be treated. Um, <laughs> real quick story. One time I was working a registered July 4th, the day. And uh, the guy came up and I had, I had run, I mean, lunch was packed. And I had run out of ones, and I was waiting on my manager, who was also getting change for somebody else, to come back with some ones. I'm giving her some money, she was going to come back with some ones. And I was, um, I was, this guy, I said, sir, I'm going to have to give you uh, four quarters, because I, I ran out of ones, but here's your four quarters, and I gave him the change. He was, he was like, where's my money? Well, I gave you, I gave you four quarters, um, just because I ran out of ones. Well, you, you guys need to find some ones. <laughs> it had been a long day, <laughs> so I just shut the cash register. You're right. I started looking under things. <laughs> <laughs> ones. 
I was following orders. I didn't find any. He didn't help. Anyway, where you are matters to how you act. Some of you can clearly think of there's there's a place where I act differently, where and there's places where you feel comfortable to act a certain way to to um, let your guard down a bit, and there's places where you have to have the guard way up. But it's where you are that often de uh, determines how you act. So your your parents probably said this something like, "Well, you know, if you're going to live in this house, this is how you're going to act." In this house. Why? Because the, I want your actions to be determined by where you are. And I want you to see the significance of this house. In this house, your actions matter. How you act matter because of where you are. And so Paul is said, say, listen, stand for, firm in a place. And that place happens to be in the Lord. And then he takes on, I would argue, the, th the reason or the occasion for the letter. The thing that first made him pin something to them. Is there an argument? Now try to imagine this. I know it's hard. There's an argument between two people in the church. This woman named Euodia this woman named Syntyche. Uh, next slide. He says, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche. The, the dual like pleading. He could say, I plead with Euodia and Syntyche. But this dual pleading is like calling them out. And actually, look, in the Greek, it's their names first. He's like, Euodia, I plead with you. Syntyche, I plead with you to be of the same mind. Now, if you put the period right there, to be of the same mind, there would be this instance of what happens with denominations, um, different groupings of church traditions. So Church of Christ and the Baptist Church and the Methodist Church, if we all got together and we said, listen, we need to be of the same mind, all three of us would then simultaneously say, and you all need to come join me. Be of the same mind, usually when we say that, what we mean is be of my mind. You need to start thinking like me because your thinking is stinking thinking. We, you, have, you have ulterior motives and I have purely and, and accurately read the scriptures. Well, that's obviously ridiculous if you're looking at it from the outside. Standing, being of the same mind is a, is a fruitless exercise if it's not found in the same place. If it's not governed by something bigger than our own minds. So he says, I plead with you to be of the same mind in the Lord. There, there, tend, there seems to be some sort of division in the Philippian church, and Paul, in the letter to the Philippians, says this phrase, in the Lord, more times than he says it in Romans, more times than he says it in Corinthians, more, time, more times than he says it in any other letter. For example, Romans is a 16-chapter uh, book, 16-chapter letter in our, in our Bible. Now, I don't want to say in our Bibles because he didn't write chapter 1 and start writing so Romans was this long letter, said it seven times. Philippians, four chapters, nine times. He's trying to get them to see that they're accepting of Epaphroditus, that we talked about earlier, that they're that they're working with one another, that they're that they're being like Jesus, that that Euodia and Syntyche working together, being of the same mind, is not just on their own will, but it dep it depends on where they are. Christianity is often like it's often confused as some sort of system where I gotta do things better. You are a Christian not because you're good at everything. If that were the case, we would none of us would be Christian. Some of you are great, great singers. Some of you are not. I'm not I don't have anybody in mind. <laughs> Some of you, some of you, some of you 
prayed, just second nature, you dropped the prayer. Some of you don't. Some of you are Bible nerds. You get like to get into the Bible and you, and you read through it. Some of you are servants and you it's just your instinct to go visit people at the nursing home. Just what you do. Some of you are workers and some of you aren't. What can happen a lot of times is because this, there's varying degrees of things. So singers, let's take singers. We'll pick on singers because I, I am one and uh, there are... Uh, Actually, that's the I used to be one voice, so never mind. That's a Miss Doubtfire joke, and that movie was so long ago. I don't know why I'm quoting it. But, uh, so pick on singers. Singers, a lot of times what happens is our church is growing, all right? Our church is, that's a fact, our church is growing. You may look around today and be like, is it? But yes, it is. Our church is growing, and it's obvious. As we've grown, the singing has got worse. And a lot of people, a lot of church president will be like, well, I'm not sure really. I don't want you. We used to be much better singers. I don't. The more people come in from the outside of your group, the less they know their songs, the less they know what those shapes on those notes mean, the less they hear harmonies, the more we should rejoice that we're getting worse at singing. Because people who aren't like us are coming to our church. Stop complaining about the singing getting worse. It means we're growing. And it's just natural. Now we say, well, I don't, there are people, we can, we can lift ourselves up because we sing. And lift, put others down because they don't. We can lift ourselves up because we pray and others down because they don't, or just imagine that others really don't quite like we do. We can every time we serve, we can think, well, I'm serving, and I can look around and see who's not serving. If you make Christianity Christianity a meritocracy, like you it's ruled by how good you're doing in something. If you make Christianity a meritocracy, it will it will eventually come around to life. Because when you make Christianity about something you, you've earned, something you're doing right, you just got to do everything the right way, you will notice all the things you do right and all the things others don't do quite as well. And you've created a hierarchy of good and not so good Christians. Let me ask you a question. Those not so good Christians are going to get to heaven less are they, going to, are they going to be in the kingdom of God less? Is there, a, is there a sliding scale of salvation? So some people are saved, like really saved, and some people are saved just but sort of. Well, those people aren't. Don't, don't, yeah. They don't do the good thing you do quite as well as you do that good thing. Guess what? They probably do a very good thing that you don't that you overlook and don't even factor into your Christianity because you're not that good at it. To be to be of the same mind, to get rid of all of those distinctions and all of that hierarchy, we no longer have to create a ladder where, or we shouldn't create a ladder where I, I do certain things better than other people. We are in Christ. We are saved, not because we made our way, way there, but because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection put us there. We are in Christ. And Paul isn't saying, get in Christ. He's saying, make sure you know where you are and let your life be dictated as such. You are no longer in just, you are no longer uh, your own person. You're no longer your own mind. You need to be of the same mind. And you're, the same mind does not need to belong to Euodia. It does not need to belong to Syntyche. It needs to belong in the Lord. Yes, disagree. That's fine. But what, what Paul's pointing to here is this idea of I, we are in Jesus first. We are following Jesus first. And we are following ourselves last. 
all church disagreements, most church disagreements, most disagreements, period, most marital disagreements, most disagreements you have with your neighbor, are all based on, I walk my way, and you are impeding my way. I say all that to say this. We're going to change the carpet from here. And I'm just kidding. But you all recognize the tension that that would bring, right? Why? We have, we have a nature about us, a selfish nature, that would allow us, that pushes us to, to walk our way. It pushes us to want to believe that we're correct. To want, believe, want to believe that they, if people aren't doing it the way I'm doing it, then my goodness, they're probably not even doing it out of good motives. That's not healthy for you. When you're in Christ, you've arrived there. Yeah, you don't pray enough. Hey, guess what? Pray more. Is it enough? What if you pray like like 50% more than you do now? Is that enough? What's enough? Define enough. Define study your Bible enough. Define serve enough. Yeah, always strive to do better, but don't let that, that scale, that sliding scale affect you and think, well, I'm a little out today. I'm a little out of the Lord. I'm a little, I'm not in the Lord. Jesus redeemed you and saved you, and His, Him putting you in Him, Him allowing you to be in the Lord, that's what unites us. Not correct thought. Jesus unites us. Not, not a proper prayer position or being able to sing really well. That doesn't unite us. Jesus Unites us. We are of the same mind, and it's only when we are in the Lord that we are in the same mind. Not that we're going to have all the same opinions, but we know that this is the most important thing. Next slide. He says, Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the in the uh, cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. They, they've been serving with me this whole time and now they're bickering. When we're bickering, we need to be brought back into the Lord. When we think I'm not good enough or those people aren't good enough, that's usually where we go. We need to, rem we need to remember whose house we are in. We need to remember where we are in the Lord. And where we are will dictate how we act. I am in the Lord. I have a lot as we, we create these strands in our life. You know, we've got, we've got the, my working place. We've got this place where I go. And I've got, um, I've got my family. Um, close family, and then I've got my in-laws over there, and I've got, and I've got this, um, you know, I've got church, sort of like spiritual life, and I got, when I go to the gym, or when I go to the movies, I've got friends that go to the movies with, and you, so you got all these elements of your life, and whenever you try to make one element be the ruler, Right? So when you say, I'm following Jesus is going to rule my workplace, you'll find that to be really difficult because it just doesn't work that way. Right? You, you can't make a hierarchy of your life and say one thing's more important and it'll be first. And then the rest of the second. Preachers have a trouble with it. Have you ever heard of the term preacher's kids? PKs? They're usually the worst kids ever. Um, no offense, John. Um, but they are. I mean, there's a sense of like, well, kids are, like preacher's kids can be nuts. One of the kids said yes. 
okay, we're just going to watch. Uh, no, the preacher's kids can be trouble. And let me tell you why that happens. At least this is my theory. Okay, so most people have this life that they can order and they can say, God first, family second, occupation third. Can you see the problem with, with preachers in that structure? Right? Because you got God, you got, you got occupation, is it sort of married to that whole God first thing? And so just instinctively, if you're going to make it into a hierarchy, it's always going to be God first, occupation second, family third as a, as a preacher. It's just going to happen. Like you can't be good at your job in the third place if you're going to keep it in third place. Because the whole God thing. Okay, see where the problem is. Okay. That's a messed up system anyway. That little hierarchy. The way it should be is family first, job second, all of it in the Lord. All of it just exists in the Lord. I am not, I don't, I don't break God, I am ruled by God. I don't have this hierarchy set up. My life is made holy by the presence of God, by the salvation of God. And so I have my family and I have my job and they are both ruled by God. That hierarchy is messed up and it will, it, it will, it will hurt you. Because you, it makes you able to divide out your life and you'll add the, the whole, the whole, all these little strands that we run in our life need to be played in symphony together by the king. When we let that happen, it changes everything because you're not just, you're not reacting to where you are in the world, you're reacting to where you are in Jesus. Family, God, my family, work, ruled by God. All your little places that you go are in the Lord, and you, you are defined by that. You're not defined by the fact that you'll pray. You're not. Not God's mouth. You're not defined by the fact that you don't know your Bible as well as you think you should. You're not defined by the fact that you, you know the Bible um, worse than you think you do. You're not defined by how good you are at it. You're defined by where Jesus put you because of how good he was at it. God put us there. We are his. Now, yes, that will affect how we live, but how we live, sometimes we get the cart before the horse on that one. <coughs> Your dad said, in this house, we act a certain way. Or when your mom said, in this house, we act a certain way. Was there any threat they were going to kick you out? Now, some of you may be so, yes. <laughs> For the most part, it was like, no, I want you here, and I want you to act a certain way. A good life comes out of an acceptance of your place. It doesn't earn you a place. But grace affects life instead of law affecting grace. So when you have those thoughts this week, I'm not enough, just acknowledge it. But then add on to it because <laughs> Satan wants you to feel awful about it. And God did not send his son for you to wallow in self-pity. Acknowledge, yeah, I'm not enough, but I'm in the Lord. And that's what matters. I have no idea what you, Odie, and Sistiki were arguing about. I, I really don't. Um, Scholars don't either. Read it, read it, read any commentary you want to. They don't know. But they'll make guesses. It doesn't keep them from guessing. But we don't know. There's just no way to know. But we know the remedy for it. The remedy for the whole book of all the problems the Philippian church was experiencing was acknowledging their place. 
where are you? So the question is going is, are you in the Lord? All phrases are that way in Romans. You've been baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. Now we're in God. And it's him putting, it's God who puts you there and then lets your place affect your practice. If you are in the Lord, you are blessed among men and women. If you are not, and you think, well, I just, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready to live that way. And you won't be until you're in the Lord. You won't be ready to live that way until you have found the one who will lead you in that way. If you need Jesus this morning, that, this is the best place to find him. Maybe because you're here. And if, if you need to quit beating yourself up, you need to repent of that. You really need to repent of beating up other people for not being as good as you. That's sin in the first degree. Find your place here in the Lord and enjoy the grace <laughs> lifts the burden of not being good enough off of you. Yeah, you're not good enough. But you're in the Lord. You need prayers. You need to repent. You need salvation this morning. In the name of Jesus, please come forward while we stand.